this land of ours and fill the sportsman's dreams. Enjoy what nature holds for us, her bounty never ends. Getting back to basics with the practical sportsman. It's always an adventure, no matter where we go. From a favorite hunting spot to the highest fishing hole. Outdoor life we all can share with family and friends. We'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. And we'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. Hello, sportsmen. You know, you got to love this time of year if you're a hunter. Time to get out to hunting camp. I'm going to show you how to set up a hunting camp on a budget. We're also going to take a look at some incredible footage of a buck and its reaction to a decoy. And a lot more. I'm Fred Trost. You stay tuned. I have tips on how you can become a more practical sportsman. White-tailed bucks. That's what bow hunting is all about. October is the time of year many of us move into the woods with these deer. Last October, we set up bow camp near Tawas. Now, we camped in the traditional way, tents. Our main camp was a pumpkin tent, large and roomy. Five of us slept in there where we had room for most of our gear, food, and stoves. Tim Farragut and I set up the frame and zipped the canvas walls in place. Where was Charlie Keenan? <laughs> right where you'd expect him, stocking food, priming the stove, mixing up pancake batter. For some reason, food never tastes better than when you cook it outdoors or have it in hunting camp. But you don't need a big tent for hunting camp. Modern, smaller ones will work. This is an auxiliary tent that we set up. This is Charlie's tent. We, we ended up not using it here at this camp, but it's always good to have it set up just in case. Now this has an exterior frame. A lot of your modern tents have exterior frames so the tent hangs inside this. You don't have tent poles inside. Very useful. This tent is lightweight, lightweight fabric that folds up very small. Now, the thing I like about this tent is it has two rooms. Actually, it's partitioned here. So this room you could come in, just say your boots were muddy. This could be the mud area. You could store your gear, your clothes, uh, things like that out in here. Now, this side of the partition is designed for sleeping. This is really a great idea for a tent. And you could probably put, you know, they'll show you how to sleep six people in something like this, but I think two, three people max would be comfortable. Uh, these tents have big windows. You can see the humidity here from the frost last night. But these windows just zip up at night for sleeping and uh, it makes a nice little tent. Now, we would have used this tent if it rained, if we had a few more people show up at camp, uh, but we, as it turned out, we didn't need it. We could survive in the pumpkin tent. Well, this October, our bow camp will be on Drummond Island, where we'll use smaller tents, fold-out campers. I expect we'll find new advantages with a group of individual tents, all like having snoring and non-snoring areas, <laughs> but no matter what kind of tent you have, some aspects of camp are always the same. We have a path beaten down right here to the facilities, as they're called. It's a very important part of all camps. This is nothing elaborate, but it does the job. Put this between two trees. These are two by fours underneath here. Put some plastic over the top. You need some protection from rain. Just it keeps it warmer here. Now, I'm going to spare you the graphic nature of this. <laughs> so I'm going to pull this out. Just stay right there, John. Okay. And here it is. This is uh, just a two by four frame. This is nailed together. Now you could use screws in something like this so you can take it down and put it up in other locations. The seat with some tape around it for comfort. And of course right here, coffee can with the paper. You can see it's been used quite a bit. But that's important to keep that paper dry. Sets on there, there's underneath here. The facilities. Okay, it's not plush, 
but it certainly is natural. You know, you camp out because you like the woods. You want to be in the woods. And it's always possible to use the woods just the way they are. After dark, the woods take on a new look, though. Deer and other wild birds and animals can operate off ultraviolet light to see where they're going. But the sun takes with it the light rays that we humans need to see. So we break out the flashlights and lanterns. LP gas lanterns are simpler, but more expensive to operate than the traditional Coleman lanterns. You can buy tripods and lantern holders, or if you want to maintain that natural look, cut three limbs with forks at the top, fashion a tripod for hanging the lantern outdoors. The advantage? It's movable and throws a maximum amount of light in all directions. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to set up a comfortable deer camp. You can stay in a tent, a trailer, or under a pickup cap. The firewood warms you when you cut it and split it, and it warms you once again when you burn it. Deer camp, oh, there's nothing like it. There's a lot of innovations in equipment for setting up a deer camp. There's also innovations for deer hunting gimmicks, gadgets, and some of these can be really practical, like a deer decoy, but there are some tricks you should know about using them. This buck chases small does because they're close and not running away. Now he turns his attention towards the larger doe, again because she's close, but when she scoots off, he sniffs the ground trying to determine if any of these does are in heat. Now his first try, though, is visual. He sees the doe standing still, which is a clue that she might be in heat. Vision is the most important sense to a deer. That's why deer decoys work. This is a plastic decoy made by Flambeau, one of the first commercial deer decoys on the market. Now, we used it successfully in Iron County and in Clare to attract bucks and does that came in from all directions when they saw it. Now here was a typical response from a doe, deliberately walking towards the decoy, somewhat alarmed, but curious. And the thing we always noticed was how much time the live deer spent looking in the direction the decoy appeared to look. The ears and the nose of the decoy were obviously recognizable shapes to the live deer, but because the decoy didn't move, the live deer wondered what was up. It seemed to make the live deer a little uneasy. Our first two years of using decoys, we found out they worked with that one little hitch that does in particular seemed to be bothered by the fact that the decoy was looking somewhere, but there was nothing to look at. So we talked to the people at the Featherflex company. Featherflex makes, I mean, the most lightweight deer decoy you can imagine. It doesn't even weigh a pound, it rolls up. Don't be bothered by the blaze orange. Their research shows that the deer think this is white. Small antlers on this buck do not intimidate other bucks. Uh, I've set the ears down on this one, so the buck looks like it's maybe looking for a scrap. It might attract another buck. This decoy you can set out. If you're only using one, I'd recommend a doe decoy and not a buck because a doe will attract virtually any buck and attract does. The key to a multiple decoy setup, which seems to solve this problem of what, are the, what is the decoy looking at, this buck looks like it's looking at this doe. This doe has its ears up, looks alert, looks receptive. That's the way you want it. And I've also added a turkey decoy over here, which is another option. You can put a turkey decoy out. So it looks like these decoys are looking at each other. That will focus the attention of the other deer. You can also use a grunt call, which seems to reassure deer that are coming into a decoy. I know it sounds elaborate. I know it sounds crazy. But these decoys, even without legs, work. Now, I don't know where this video was taken. It was provided by the people who make the Featherflex decoy, but it shows some interesting behavior of white-tailed deer, especially large bucks, when they encounter decoys. Now, you can draw your own conclusions from what you see, but I'll give you my impression of what's going on based on my experiences with deer and deer decoys. Now, what you're seeing is the initial curiosity of a buck, keying in on the deer's head, ears, and antlers. He approaches from the rear, nudges, then begins attacking that phony buck. Within 40 seconds, the attack becomes serious. The live buck licks its nose, trying to pick up scent from the decoy. But there's no live deer scent, and the manufactured foam odor is not something that a deer fears, so it continues attacking. 
Now, deer fights usually attract other large breeding bucks, not small ones, because other bucks have learned that there's usually a doe in heat nearby. And that's what the spectator bucks are looking for. Now, here's another thing that fascinates me. Why the buck attacks tree branches as well as the decoy? Maybe branches and antlers and fighting relate to the rubbing behavior. Now, you'd think that the live buck would know the decoy is a hoax, but it still attacks that upside-down piece of foam. I think it still recognizes the shape of the head and ears, and that's what keeps the buck going. Now, this looks comical to me, but that buck isn't playing. It's serious. Now it smells and licks the nose of the doe decoy. Now that's a visually stimulated behavior. Remember the tip about setting decoys so they're looking at each other? Well, this seems to work. The bucks and does seem more intensely interested and focused on the pair of decoys, much more so than my experiences with one decoy that looks off into nowhere. Now this entire attack lasts over three minutes, so it wasn't quick and it wasn't gentle. But get ready because this buck isn't done. Now here's something I've never seen before. What do you make of it? It's logical that when deer fight, they also bite, but I just never thought of deer reacting that way. You'll hear the hunter in the tree blowing a grunt call periodically. According to the Featherflex people, the sound of a grunt call during these encounters seems to keep the live deer focused even more. And as commonly happens around a deer fight, another buck about the same size or bigger comes in, but the original buck continues with his attacks. Can you believe this? Fatal antler attacks, twisting, knocking the head and neck, and then attacking the head. Now, that's what makes me think that live deer key in on the head and ears. That's the most important part of a decoy. I don't think a buck would react this aggressively to a hard plastic decoy, but this foam apparently has a, a flesh-like texture. Now, deer do smell and lick each other when they meet, but here's something really weird. The doe acts like she's greeting this bedded buck, but loses her cool and begins nibbling the antler. Very, very weird. One thing this video proves is that deer aren't very smart, not nearly as smart as hunters, and nature films and cartoons make deer out to be. Now notice this live buck's ears, they're down. That's an aggressive signal. The buck is coming in with a hostile attitude. He's keyed in on the decoy, on its head, he circles and comes around it again. This is when the archer in the tree decides to take a shot, aiming for the heart. Now, how does a deer react to a razor-sharp arrow? Watch. The buck trots off. The arrow is passed through its heart in a fraction of a second. Now, typically, an arrowed buck will cover about 100 yards in the next 8 or 10 seconds, quickly becoming dizzy and expiring. Well, to my way of thinking, a well-placed shot with an arrow doesn't jolt the deer. In fact, it happens so fast that I doubt the deer feels anything except dizziness. In the hands of a competent archer, a razor-sharp broadhead can dispatch a deer cleanly and humanely. We give wild creatures far too much credit for being smart. They're not smart, but they are wary. But they can be fooled rather easily. It appears that both the decoy and the live deer, in different ways, have lost their heads. I realize a lot of people aren't really in tune with hunting. Most people don't give a rip one way or the other, but some people are against it. They think it's cruel and inhumane. They think uh, using an arrow like this, it's very sharp, hurts a deer. Well. I don't think so. There's no scientific research on pain in animals because we can't talk to animals, but I think a lot of the pain we talk about, we've educated ourselves into. There's lots of evidence that hunters have uh, that animals don't feel pain like we do. And here's another example of a deer in our trophy book. Interesting thing about this, to me, is that the part of your story is that you shot this deer 
and the arrow passed clear through it. Clear it, through. It, it, it didn't hit just behind the last rib, was it? Right behind the last rib, and I was 30 yards out, and I was about 15 feet up in a tree stand, and passed through, and I think I got it like a spleen shot. Passed through, and he come, he bucked up, ran out in front of me. He stopped at 20 yards, turned around, started grunting, and pawing his front feet, and I reached down, got another arrow, and got him for a second time. And Man, so, I mean, that kind of shows you that, that the deer doesn't really feel an arrow going through. I really don't think he knew what hit him. But he was, it made him mad. He jumped clean off the ground, all four legs. And then came back and started pawing and grunting? And grunting and yeah. snorting. Yeah. And while you knocked another arrow? And yeah, got him a second time. Awesome, but this is a six point that qualifies with a 19 inch spread. That's a heck of a trophy. Congratulations on that one. That was James Ballard from Shelby Township who relayed his experience, something all hunters think about. You know, our goal is a humane kill, and that's worth far more than just getting a buck for the trophy book. Creamy rabbit casserole. Oh, look at this. This is a, a dish that is almost too simple. We put a, a number of simple dishes on the air this year. Let me find some of the rabbit down in here. <laughs> this rabbit is fresh cottontail, too, by the way. Uh, Carrie Chase submitted this recipe. Carrie, yes. you when, when I saw that it had these ramen noodles in it, <laughs> I love these little things. I do, too. They're, uh, it, well, I'll get to that in a second here. Here you go, Al. <laughs> Al's good, a man. Al's our rabbit man, but he has to <laughs> clarify something about this rabbit. These are the noodles that are the main component. I love, mm -hmm. it. they only cost like 20, 25 cents a, right. mm -hmm. a deal. And a lot of college students and, you know, people eat them because they're cheap and stuff. And they're uh, fast. Eat, and they're you know, fast. Uh, and I don't know, I love them. Yep. Cream of mushroom soup, milk. That's it. Rabbit. It, rabbit boned out. Yep. Okay, now this is fresh rabbit. You want to tell the yeah. story about uh, the rabbit? Yeah, we was. This was yesterday. We, we you was, realized you didn't right. have it in the freezer. Yeah, we were supposed to do this recipe today. And uh, I went to the freezer and didn't have no rabbit. So we only had an hour and I had to go to a wedding. So I called my friend and we went to get some rabbits. And I seen two and missed two and he shot both of them. So we're really <laughs> his rabbit, not mine. Okay, go ahead. Give his name. Give him uh, credit. Steve Van Ertwick, one of my okay. hunting buddies. Thank you, Steve, <laughs> yeah. for your eagle eye shooting. Mmm. <laughs> you know this meat has a flavor. Mm-hmm. It's from, because the ramen noodles. Right. Th these have a little packet in it. <coughs> and that, that goes yeah, in there. Seasonings, you don't right. see that right here. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'll tell you what. All you do is make the noodles like it says on the package, and then in the pan you just add a half can of milk, mm -hmm. and then the cream of mushroom soup, and then add the rabbit. Oh. By the way, if you don't have rabbit, if you don't have a friend named Steve who can shoot straight, <laughs> you could use chicken, you could you use could turkey, you could, you could use, use any kind of bird mm -hmm. or rabbit or, or anything like that. I wonder that. how red meat would be. I bet it would be good. It would probably be good, too. And then they've got beef flavor. And then they have the beef mm -hmm. flavor, so maybe you could do just about the same thing mm -hmm. with beef. I think it would you be might, good. You might have to do that if you don't start straightening up mm -hmm. your shooting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I tell you, this is so simple, easy. Carrie, <laughs> it's great, great recipe. Thank you. This outstanding recipe is in the October-November issue of the Practical Sportsman magazine. Let's take a look at a few of the letters which we've put in our viewer mail issue of the Practical Sportsman magazine. Jenny Downham from Taylor says, I object and am offended by the discriminatory M-A-N title ending chosen for your show, meaning the man in sportsman. Your comment on this matter would be appreciated. Well, Jenny, I've wrestled with this word for a while, and I always end up the same. A male-oriented dilemma. Apparently, the object is to get rid of the male, the M-A-N ending on the word. So what happens if I use the word sportswoman? Uh-oh, there it is again, that nasty M-A-N ending. Okay, let's use the more scientific word female, sports female. Uh-oh, there's that nasty word male. Can't use that either. Oh, oh, I've got it. Let's go to the generic sports person. Oh, there we go. No, no, look at that ending. It's a male-oriented S-O-N, son. I guess that won't solve the problem either. Hey, I'm stuck, Jenny. I don't see a way around it, and frankly, I don't see why it should be such a problem. I think the word sportsman should be accepted and used by both men and women. What do you other viewers think? Are you bothered by this? 
Pete Gatteri from Holt sent me this picture. He and his cousin were fishing in a lake in Marquette County in the UP when they spotted something black and white in the water. They paddled their canoe closer. It was a skunk. Pete said the skunk never looked at the canoe or changed its course. It went a couple hundred yards across the lake. A strange sight for sure. Thanks for the picture, Pete. Okay, this way, John, this way. Is this the right way? You know where we're going? No. Okay, well, I don't exactly either, but I do know one thing. When you go into the woods, if you have a pin-on compass like this, and you know you came in from the north going south, if you want to find your way back, just go north again, go the opposite way. That's a real simple way to use a compass. This weekend at the museum, we're going to have a special event uh, for not just kids. This is normally our youth weekend, but for hunters as well, using compasses like this to navigate right on this property. In fact, this, oh, the geese are flying. I'll tell you what, there's no better time than the fall. Oh, John, look at them. We got some more coming over here. Oh, this is great. I tell you, don't spend time like this indoors, please, this weekend. Grab a kid, grab a parent, grab somebody, get outdoors. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Next week on The Practical Sportsman, we'll focus on white-tailed deer behavior, methods of attracting deer, what turns them on and what turns them off. John Ford and I will be in a 65-acre enclosure with wild deer videotaping their reaction and behavior as we test different products. We'll have an unusual home video, another scrumptious recipe, and a lot more. Even if you're not a deer hunter, you'll find this show interesting. And if you are, hey, you're going to want to make sure you join me next week, same time, same station, right here for another brand new edition of The Practical Sportsman.